Good morning and welcome to Grace Presbyterian Church on this second Saturday, Sunday in October. Uh, if you see a lot of people in pink t-shirts arriving today, that's not exactly a new fashion statement, at least not for the guys, but it is a statement of support for the Susan Komen Walk to Cure Breast Cancer at last count. More than three dozen members of this fellowship were committed to join Team Grace for that effort this Sunday morning, and we're very glad they did so. So I hope that you will join me, uh, it, perhaps even now in the service, to give them a little hand for doing that. In the Bible text we'll read today, the Apostle Paul clearly needs a helping hand He's anticipating a long winter of confinement, probably in Rome, and he's not yet prepared for that season. Not only that, he's lonely, just as Coleman needs Team Grace to help them fight against breast cancer. Paul needed a good team as well, but most of those whom he wanted to participate were not available. And that's why he asked his best friend, his best and truest friend, to come. We'll be saying much more about that a bit later in the service, but for now, I invite you to join me in the worship of a God who does walk with us even when we feel alone and who sends us to serve others in their struggles, too. Please stand for the call to worship, if you're able. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood, shed on the cross.
You may be seated. This time I invite the kids to come forward as I have a brief word for them. Come on down. All right. So good to see all of you today. Really glad that you are here. And I want to talk to you today about a saying I learned when I was probably about your age. Yeah, it's, it's printed right up there. It says, a friend in need is a friend indeed. Any of you think you might know what that means? Yeah. Indeed means truly, means a true friend, someone you can count on. So basically, a friend in need is someone who shows up when you're having some struggles or some problems in the world. Today's Bible text describes that kind of friendship between the Apostle Paul and a much younger man named Timothy. When Paul was really struggling, he depended on Timothy to show up and help him with his needs. But the cool thing about that story and the cool thing about the Bible is you don't have to be an adult to do that. Your kids can do that too. You know, when there's someone, for example, say you're playing hard outside, somebody falls down and gets hurt, you can just ignore them, you can walk off, or you can stop. You can check on them, see how they're feeling, see if you can help them with their needs. When someone at school maybe seems to be kind of sad and withdrawn, you can like totally ignore them, whatever, or you can go talk to them. You can see what's going on. And even sometimes in your family, even sometimes with mom or dad, it looks like they're just having a rough day. You know, you can ignore that, play with your video games, or you can just kind of sneak up and give them a big hug because that helps so much when your kids do that. So pure and simple, a friend in need is a friend indeed, and you can be that too, everyone. So let us pray. Dear God, we do thank you so much that we don't have to be adults. People of all ages can be good and true friends, just like Timothy was for Paul. Help us, God, to follow that example so that your grace might be revealed as well. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Great to see all of you today. Have a good one in Sunday school. Take care. invited to consider how we live as followers of Christ and the saints, to look at our decisions and our actions straight on, and to hold them up as the, to the examples they set, and to make amends. As we pray the prayer of confession together, let us look at our lives with honesty. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Gracious and holy God, we thank you for all those who have now known, who have kept the faith, who have finished the race, and who have joined the great companies of saints in heaven. Forgive us, Lord, for the times that we have failed to follow them, and help us in your mercy to pursue the strength they share. For we ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. Jesus has called us to follow him, and he will not lead us astray. His path of one is one of forgiveness and renewal. Know that you are forgiven, and so you are ready to go out and serve. Amen. Good morning, everyone. We have a new one for you this morning. This is a, a new, uh, more modern arrangement from the Gaither Vocal Band, so we hope you enjoy. Through the thick and thin, through the 
the fire and wind to a better place. You brought us out. And now we'll take a moment to pass the peace with one each other, one another. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> you may be seated. One way in which we can glorify God is by sharing in many opportunities for both service, faith, and fellowship. And there are lots of those coming up this month. First, as I've already mentioned, we can thank those who have completed the Susan B. Coleman Walk for to cure breast cancer, not only with our words, but also with our cash. There are links for that purpose on our website and probably several folks here today who could receive that offering as well. Second, we can bless the faithful few who work every single week to prepare this church for guests, all sorts of guests, by joining the church grounds cleanup this coming Saturday at 9 a.m., especially for those who work in the nonprofit sector where so many things are intangible. There's actually something very satisfying about working on the grounds, trimming trees and shrubs, immediate results. Don't have to worry about long-term stuff. There's also something quite rewarding about spreading mulch. So, because all that makes our ground look good. Um, so, if you'd like to be with us, we would love to see you there. Third, you can join both parents and children of our church for a showing of Hotel Transylvania, a really lighthearted take on Halloween. No one has to get scared. You just have to come have some fun. Costumes optional. And that's this Saturday at 5 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Fourth, if you know how to use a paintbrush or perhaps some other simple tools, you can join us at a Brush with Kindness, our Habitat for Humanity project in Sun City. That will be a week from Saturday. Um, and our purpose in doing all this is to help our, some senior citizens to remain safely in their homes. That starts at 8 o'clock on the 21st. Several other opportunities for fellowship and service are listed in this month's newsletter. Don't have time to share all of them now, but copies of that newsletter are available in the Narthex, and many of you will have received one by now online. Moving on to prayer concerns, hope you'll remember KC Parks, who was hospitalized last week after a head injury. He's home now, but not quite out of the woods, so we hope you'll pray for him. Hope you remember George Castro, as, who has had increasing difficulty eating within the last few months, lost a lot of weight. Remember Barb Fisk, who's feeling cooped up until she finally gets cleared for surgery. Sally Grothy, who will be undergoing a number of tests for health issues later this month. And Tom Grothy's sister, Mary, who has been placed in hospice care. On the positive side of the ledger, we can celebrate new beginnings for Hazel Crowder, who is healing from surgery. Peggy Ingerick, who is planning to relocate to a retirement home soon. And Bernadine Anderson, who is planning to get married within the days to come. We are so happy that love has come again for her. And with those thoughts in mind, let us pray. Dear God, we are so grateful for your presence with us both in happiness and in heartaches, in laughter, loss, and tears. You go with us to comfort and to guide. You promised you would. Lo, I am with you always. Encouraged by that promise, we intercede today for all those who are struggling from natural or man-made problems. We intercede for the people of New England who have been lashed by recent storms. May they find the strength to dry out and to rebuild. We intercede for the victims of gun violence and their families. May they help us stop that scourge somehow. We intercede for the people who we have voted into office at local, state, and national levels. Give them the courage to do what's right for all the people that they serve, not just the group that may have elected them. We intercede for the people of Ukraine and their struggle to stray free against enormous odds and their efforts to sustain morale. 
Finally, God, we intercede for us, each one of us, that we might have the strength to bring your mercy and your grace to those who need it most. We ask it in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ the Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Chancel Choir, there is so much power in knowing that we are God's children and that He cares for us. There's also a lot of power in developing that relationship with others, humans outside our own families who we might come to see as surrogate parents, and humans outside our family who we might come to see as surrogate children too. From everything we can tell, the Apostle Paul had that sort of relationship with Timothy, a devoted young disciple whom he treated like a son. 
And it's pretty clear in Scripture that Timothy also felt close to him. That's why when Paul was struggling with loneliness in a cold, dark prison cell, he chose to write to Timothy with a very clear request. Come. There are things that I will need to survive the winter months. I need for you to get them. I need for you to bring them. And I need for you to do that now. It's a pretty powerful message. It comes to us from the second letter of Timothy, chapter 4, beginning with verse 9. So I invite you to listen carefully for the Word of God to you. Do your very best to come quickly, for Demas, who loved this present era, abandoned me and went off to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone into Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia, while I sent Tychicus to Ephesus. Only Luke is with me. Lots of names in this paragraph. The first, Demas, is obviously a disappointment. That's because he had been listed as a faithful disciple in a two other letters that Paul wrote. We don't know exactly what changed between those letters and this one, but something in Thessalonica must have been incredibly appealing, perhaps a romantic interest, I don't know. I do know that Paul felt abandoned by him, disappointed by that choice. The other folks in this list are probably not disappointments, at least not moral disappointments. Titus, for example, was revered throughout the church, which often sent him to accomplish tasks that were both sensitive and delicate when churches were in conflict. One of the most famous was his mission to admonish the Corinthian church and then to collect a big offering from them. Neat trick, if you could pull it off. In a similar manner, every reference to Tychicus in the New Testament is positive while the work of Crescens is otherwise unknown. But the bottom line for most of these folks is simply this, they were busy. They couldn't come when Paul wanted. They were busy, and they had to be away. Unfortunately, that didn't make life easier for Paul. It made it harder, much harder, because he was down to one, one person, Luke. One person who could feed him, one person who could clothe him, one person who could send his letters to the world. Most important writer of that era had only one attendant to meet his every need while he was in prison. And that made life very difficult for them both. I'm sure he was grateful for Luke, I'm sure Luke was grateful for him, But that level of dependence is exhausting. And that's why Paul says, come. Do your very best to come quickly. And do not come alone. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful in my ministry. When you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas, and my scrolls, especially the parchments. So Paul requests three things here. First, a disciple by the name of Mark. Second, a cloak to keep him warm within the winter months. Third, scrolls, rolled up scrolls, especially those that have been made with parchment. Those of you who haven't heard that term in a while, parchment is actually lamb's skin that is extensively treated before anyone writes on it. They did it in the ancient world because land skin parchments lasted much longer than others did, but it was very expensive. So they were usually reserved for extremely precious books, typically books of the Bible. I'm guessing in this case it might be Genesis, Exodus, Isaiah, and Psalms, because all those are used extensively by New Testament writers, but we cannot know for sure. In a similar fashion, we don't know who Carpus was outside this text, but the fact that Timothy was sent specifically to him meant at least two things. First, this cloak was valuable, and second, Carpus was trustworthy enough to keep it and preserve it, for Paul. If 
Finally, we can't be certain about the identity of Mark in this text, but based upon this passage and a couple of other references, most scholars think it was John Mark who accompanied both Paul and Barnabas on their first missionary journey. Kind of an interesting journey. Somewhere along that trip, John Mark left. We don't know why. Scripture never tells us that. Barnabas thinks he's still trustworthy. Barnabas wants to continue working with him later. Paul doesn't. Paul's really, really ticked. Doesn't want to ever see that guy again. So the fact that Paul is asking for him here is actually quite remarkable. All these other faithful disciples like Titus and Tychicus, they're not available. He doesn't ask for them. But John Mark is. And so Paul asks for him. That gives us some hope, I think, for other characters in this passage, too. Alexander the coppersmith did me a lot of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. For those of you keeping count, this is the seventh specific person Paul mentions in this morning's text after Demas, Titus, Crescens, Tychicus, Carpens, and Luke. Now, Alexander the Carpenter Smith, we don't know much else about him outside this passage, but we do know that silversmiths in Ephesus caused Paul a lot of harm, he interfered with idol making there. Might have damaged the coppersmith's business too. We don't know for sure. But we do know if this is the same Alexander Paul mentions in chapter 1 of the letter, then he was actually an apostate Christian. Someone who had had the faith but lost it. Based upon this morning's text, we're not exactly sure if that was the case. But we do know this. He actually became an opponent of St. Paul and a strong one. That's why Paul says, watch out for him. The danger is not over. As you're traveling to help me, watch out for him. It's a pretty serious warning. At, at my first defense, no one came to support me. Instead, all of them abandoned me. May this not be charged against them. Fortunately, the Lord stood by my side and gave me strength so that the gospel might be persuasively proclaimed and that all the Gentiles might hear it. That's how I was rescued from the lion's mouth. In this section, it's clear Paul was discouraged that no one from the local church stood with him at his first defense. Perhaps they were embarrassed. Perhaps they were intimidated. Perhaps they were unsure. We don't know. We do know that God stood with him. Paul feels God's presence with him even when no one else is there, and that presence gives him strength to press on. In this particular case, we don't know if Paul was literally saved from the lion's mouth or if that was just a figure of speech. Some Christians were fed to lions in gladiator contests, but they actually weren't fun to watch. They didn't fight back like gladiators did. So they were usually pushed off by another means. In any case, we do know Paul was saved, at least in some sense, both by God's presence with him and by his own words. That fact gives him confidence to work on. Having seen this, I am confident that the Lord will rescue me from every evil deed and bring me safely into his kingdom in heaven. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Achilla and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus remained in Corinth, and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to come before winter. Eubulus greets you, and so do Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and all the brothers and sisters. The Lord be with your spirit, and grace be with you all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be Thanks to God. Be to God. Having already mentioned seven close associates in the first part of this passage, two of whom were disappointing, Paul concludes it with the mention of nine more. Five of them are well known. Priscilla and Achilla, for example, were tent makers just like Paul and very early converts to the Christian movement. Paul stayed with them in Corinth and they went with him to Ephesus. He actually placed them in charge of that church while he was gone. They were some of his most 
trusted companions. Onesiphorus was also a very trusted friend who served with Paul in Ephesus and searched hard for him in Rome until he found him. The memory of that search would be quite precious, I think, to Paul as he wrote this morning's text. Erastus was a missionary who Paul sent to Macedonia several years before, and Trophimus was one of seven trusted disciples sent to protect Paul on his trip to Philippi. They were sort of like bodyguards in this sense, even though in this passage, he's too sick to sail to Rome. The last four names on this list, Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, and Claudia, are virtually unknown, but it's interesting that at least one of these name leaders is female. It's also interesting that Paul ends this particular passage with the same verb that began it, come. Come before winter. Come, because I really need you now. Question is, what does that mean for us? You and me today. I'd suggest three things. First, healthy faith is built upon relationships, all sorts of relationships. It's not just you and God. It's you and me and God and lots of others. Inevitably, some of those relationships will be disappointing, like Demas, who abandoned him, and Alexander, who eventually opposed him. But most of them are not. Some of the folks in this text are basically bodyguards for Paul, while others served as emissaries, delivering Paul's directives to the church. The very best of them were friends, really close friends, the kind of friend you can trust to act like family, the kind of friend who drops their plans to meet your needs. There are three of those, the 16 people in this morning's text, Luke, who stays with him when all the rest are gone. Timothy, who will go to him from everything we can tell. And Mark, whom Timothy is asked to bring as well. As I mentioned earlier, the inclusion of Mark's name is pretty remarkable in this context because Mark had not been helpful to Paul in the past. But by the time this text is written, something changed dramatically. So dramatically that Paul asked for him by name. That means there's room in Paul's circle for all sorts of friends, even those who might have hurt him in the past. If we follow his example, that will also be true of us. In order to be faithful, in order to be useful, we need to build relationships, all sorts of relationships. And forgiveness is often essential in that task. That's the first point of the passage. Here's the second one. Some relationships require extraordinary levels of attention. They just do. If you live long enough, there will come a time when you need help from good friends. If you're lucky, you might have a spouse like Luke staying with you every day, or perhaps an adult child might fill much of that role, but if you live long enough, one's not enough. Just one woman, just one man is not enough. And when that day comes, there's some hard questions to ask. But the most important one is who? Who will do it? Who will change their plans to care for you? Of the 16 people in this morning's text, most were not available. They weren't bad people. They were faithful from all we could tell, but they simply weren't available to Paul. Three were. Three were. And I think they were quite essential in his life and work and ours. Thinking about that reality, I was reminded of a woman whose story I heard about the other day. She was facing a terminal diagnosis, and she had no children who could help, so she called her friends together not to say goodbye, but to say help. I need you. I really do. I don't want to wear you out. 
but I've got to have some friends who will stick with me in this last journey I must make. Can I count on you? Some said no. Some were able but not willing. Some were willing but not able. Life just didn't allow that for them. But some said yes. They organized themselves to help her, you know, some on Tuesday, some on Thursday, some on weekends, all that sort of thing. They also hired help in the evenings. Together, they became her family at this important time of life, growing much closer not just to her but to each other. They also had some wonderful times together of prayer and worship with the Lord. When all was said and done, each of them was blessed. But each of them was challenged, too. And that leads to the last point. When someone in life's winter calls for you, how will you respond? Sometimes it is easy. You love the person dearly. You spent many years together. You've got some time to spare. Sure, yeah, I'm there. But other times it's hard. You do not have the money. You do not have the energy. You do not have the time. And if that is the case, this job is not for you. That's an interesting well, <laughs> as uh, a spiritual director once told me many years ago, the world is full of needs. You can't possibly meet all the world's needs. But a calling is a need with your name on it. Some people say, if not me, who? Who? Who will help that person? Who will meet their needs? If not me, who? And that question can change a lot of things in this world. I thought about that principle, and when thinking about this text, I was reminded of two women who I knew in my very first church. The older woman, whose name was Lonnie Lackey, was notoriously difficult. At one time, she was quite accomplished, both personally and professionally. She ran her own business when that was rare for women, and she became a scratch golfer, too. In fact, she was so good at golf, she refused to use the women's tees. She thought, I'm as good as the men. I'll, I'll strike them just like they do. That didn't make her easy to be with, especially for younger women whom she didn't think quite measured up. One of them was a housewife named Peggy Herb who had a very unusual laugh. Lonnie hated that laugh, and she didn't hide it. Instead, she made fun of it publicly. And in the women's group, she went out of her way to put Peggy down in her place. Lead us to say there was no love lost between them. But when Lonnie got a bit older, the relationship began to change. Lonnie didn't change. If anything, she got worse. After entering an assisted living home, she often yelled at the staff. She always complained about the food. She refused to brush her teeth, and she insisted on a diet of raw onions daily. <laughs> How'd you like to live with that? But when Lonnie got kicked out of two retirement homes and had nowhere else to go, Peggy asked that very big question. Lonnie didn't have any family. Peggy said, if not me, who? She decided this was a calling. So she spent some time with Lonnie repairing a very difficult relationship. 
I wouldn't say she was ever like Timothy, but she was a whole lot like John Mark, doing what had to be done at a later point in time. She dropped everything she had to care for Lonnie during the next several weeks. Together, they found a third home that would take her in, and Peggy promised all the staff that they could call on her. Whenever anything went south, you call on me, I'll get it done. With that promise, they retained her. And together with the staff, Peggy and Lonnie made it work. It was a huge undertaking, but also a blessed one, so blessed that Peggy grieved for many days when Lonnie finally did pass away, and so blessed that Lonnie once said to me, I misjudged her. I didn't understand who she was. Now I do. Now I do. And I'll never be the same. So the bottom line is simply this. Life's demanding. Life's compelling. You can't serve everyone or meet every need. But there are some needs that really do have your name on it. Who's your Timothy? Who's your Mark? Who's your Paul? And what can you do to make some space for them? Let us pray. Your God. Sometimes the very biggest challenges that we must face in life become the biggest blessings, too. If we choose to heed your call, so help us, God, to listen and teach us, God, to serve. For we do ask it in our Savior's holy name. Amen.
hear the good news of the gospel. God has a call for every one of you. Sometimes it is easy, sometimes it is hard, really hard. But even in the midst of that difficulty, there are blessings that you cannot receive until you go. So go forth with God's blessing to bless the lives of others, remembering that Christ walks with you. Amen.